Well, good afternoon to everybody. Last time we left off having covered Romans the 11th chapter, and today we will find ourselves. I beg your pardon? I, uh, I did cover three chapters. And at any rate, so we'll move over. We've covered those two chapters, uh, those three chapters, but in 11 and 12, we covered the subject of what are we and what do we do about it? What is it that makes a change in us once we come to the point where we realize who we truly are? And we found that it was by faith alone that we're saved. It's by faith alone in the ability, the abilities and the willingness of God that we change. And I'd like to back up just a, a little bit and go to that 12th, 12th chapter. Actually, let's back up just a little bit further and go to the end of the 11th chapter. Beginning in the 33rd verse. Oh, the depth of the riches, both of the wisdom and the knowledge of God. This is the HCSB if it sounds a little different than yours. How unsearchable his judgments and untraceable his ways. For who has known the mind of the Lord? Or who has been his counselor? Or who has ever first given to him and he has to be repaid? For from him and through him and to him are all things. To him be the glory forever. Amen. And then from the 11th to the 12th. Therefore. Anytime there's a therefore, what do we have to find out? what it's there for. He's making a transition concerning the greatness of, the God, of God and the fact that he owes no one anything. God could have been completely justified if he had seen the, the world spiring out of control, men turning their back, shaking their fist in his face, Romans, the first part, tells us that every human being, every family group, had an original grasp from Adam's knee of a truth that was coming and chose not to retain it in their memories and no longer taught it to their children until it came to the point where they actually believed that it was not so. And after seeing men as they truly were, making a plan. But he would have been completely justified if he had just said, I don't want to play this game anymore. And wiped out everything in creation. You think about it. If God did that, who would be left to accuse him? No one. He could do it and no one would be left to speak a single word in retribution. But he didn't. He chose a longer, sure, righteous, just path. And it was entirely from his hand alone. A point that he tried to drive home all through the Old Testament. 
and man didn't get it. Therefore, brothers. Now remember what's just happened. He's spoken of sanctification and the way it comes. How does it come? By faith. How does salvation come? You can say it. It's okay. By faith, doesn't it? He's spoken of that that way. Now he's going to make a transition and a change with the 12th chapter. And he's going to begin to speak to Christians that have come to understand where the change comes from. And he's going to say, now that your heart and mind has changed, now that faith has become your mechanism to correct those things that you don't want to do, now that that's true, let me tell you what your walk is going to look like because you're now using the right tools. Therefore, brothers... Can you repeat that? I fall off. So if you repeat that... <laughs> That's okay, please. you're honest. Oh, well. <laughs> that he is now going to speak to us as those who have gotten the gist that change comes by faith and that faith is the right tool. And he's going to begin to speak to us about what our walk should look like. Okay, that's the part I need to see. But to achieve it is by faith. This really hits me today because we're living in a time that is not very much different than Noah's time. Scripture tells us that the end will come. It'll be like it was in the time of Noah. Mm -hmm. And it is looking very much like Noah. It's looking like those times. Question is when you're a Christian, okay, you know the end's coming. You can genuinely see the handwriting on the wall. We often wonder when that's going to happen, and I certainly have no absolute date. But I don't know about you, but I have this sense in my heart that it's a done deal. And not just in some way off, ethereal, sweet by and by. I got the sense that it's in the air. I'm more convinced today than I've ever been before that what God says about the ultimate and total moral depravity of human beings has about run its course. I'm also convinced more than I ever have been that the promises of God, both for judgment and for rescue of those that believe, are absolutely true and that they are facts just yet unseen. Paul speaks to these people about, so how is it you act out the rest of your life knowing what you know now? Therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, the mercy that he gives us in that we have access by faith, I urge you, Let's take that walk it back to the Greek. This is what he's saying. This is a sincere comment that somebody leans forward, looks into your eyes, and says, we got a relationship and I've come to love you. I'm begging you. I urge you to present your bodies as living sacrifices, holy and pleasing to God. This is your spiritual worship. So what does he mean by that? Some people run right back to the Mosaic law again. And they say that this presenting your body as a living sacrifice is to run right back and try to live it all perfect again. We just spent chapter after chapter 
going over the fact that the changes only come by faith. What he's talking about here, he's saying, wherever you find yourself today, having become firm in faith, I'm asking you to believe God with all your heart. And whatever he says, believe that it's true. And whatever comes in to attack the reality that God has revealed to us, that which pulls on the flesh to go a different direction, that which calls out as Lucifer did to Eve at the tree to say you'll not surely die and call God a liar and imply that God is holding out on us when we have pressure at work when we have pressure from other family members that are saying that kind of an idea is fanatical you've got to live in the real world He's saying here, take the abuse and believe God above everything else. Had a phone call this morning. Uh, there was a guy that I told you about before. I prayed for him for 20 years. Had just about given up. Talked to him over and over again. He called me up one morning and says, hey, I went into this church and I got saved. And listen to what they told me. Well, I knew the script. I've been saying it for 20 years. <laughs> However, that's the day when it became real for him. Praise God. That's great. I'm glad, I'm glad it happened for him. However, he's a fairly new believer. And because we have a close personal relationship, he often calls me when there's some confusion between what is becoming apparent to him in the word and a life practice that's an easier route. And since he doesn't want to shout at God, he shouts at me. It's quite a relationship. And I always try to listen patiently. Try, big, big try, okay? and to try to explain things. And this morning, he's a fairly conservative fellow. We inevitably got on the topic of two decisions made by the Supreme Court. The first decision required that these learned justices, all nine, read through a document and simply interpret the wording of the document. Not decide social policy, not decide intent, just read the word for its clearest meaning. Four of them did exactly that, which is the mandate for the Supreme Court. Five, for whatever agenda, elected to throw over 230 years of Supreme Court practice into the garbage and to make social policy. Essentially, they shredded the Constitution as if it were toilet paper. Now, not, that is not merely my opinion. That is a rough paraphrase from the minority opinion written by Justice Scalia. And in an uncommon move, all four dissenting justices wrote opinions. And to a person said, this has shredded our Constitution. It's wrong. Can it be overturned? There, there, there's a discussion about that. I broke my heart when I heard that. Made me feel like something in my country died. The second decision was more grievous than the first. 
The second decision concerned an issue that the Supreme Court should never have taken up. It has always been and should have always remained a state's rights issue. And that is the issue of forcing all states to respect the marriage of two people of the same sex that has been performed in another state. And in effect, calling it a constitutional right. There are three definite things that God put into place and made institutions in his dealings with human beings. The very first one was the establishment of the institution of merit, where God himself, the creator of the universe, the only one that has the instruction man, manual for human beings, the one that wrote it, elected for marriage to be between one man who would fulfill a ministry to one woman who would fulfill a ministry and he would call these two individuals into a relationship with himself. Any marriage that just has two partners is none of his. A marriage that God has decided should be prior to that marriage and he calls two sold out bond servant people into and they respond in obedience is marriage. Now you say, what about people who were married before they were saved? Paul makes that clear in the book of Corinthians. He says that God accepts that marriage as if he had put it together. God will do what's necessary to change and mold and make that work if those partners are willing to allow God to work. I saw on television those who were gathered at the steps of the Supreme Court under various banners and signs, locked in locked arms, raised fists, the Supreme Court of the United States, many members of our executive branch, many members of our Congress, linked arms to shake their fist in the face of the creator of the universe. The second institution that he established was the institution of government, specifically after the flood, and for only one purpose at that time, to adjudicate the necessities for capital punishment. Those that oppose capital punishment, I'll never understand that. They obviously have never read anything about Noah and what happened. And the purpose of government was for the protection of the body politic. That was their whole thing. Nothing else. And then finally, the institution of salvation for believers. And now those in our government have taken it upon themselves. Five non-elected justices to say, your God is wrong and we know better than he does. my heart sank. Well, the way this came about is he, I said to this fellow, using his name, I just feel like 
we may have spit in God's face as a nation for the last time. I didn't, I didn't have an angel show up in my bedroom. I didn't have a grand revelation. I didn't even get a donkey to speak to me. I didn't have any of that. All I had was a witness on the inside. I got into my car the morning I heard it, drove to work in tears and crying, not because I hate people who choose that lifestyle, because, but because I just don't feel there's anything I can do to save my nation. I told that to this friend, and this friend said, well, why do you think God would punish an entire nation for that? And my response was to say, you got to read the whole book. And then, of course, I asked him the question. I always ask him, knowing the answer. Are you going to a church where they teach it book by book, chapter by chapter, verse by verse, so that you get the whole gist of God's mind in a particular set, a set of teachings? And he said, well, no. But the music is good. So I commenced to try to explain that God deals with nations. As I went through that and I explained it, he became extremely angry. And the reason he did is he says, how is it just for God to punish people that weren't even involved? I said, what do you mean? He said, I didn't elect those five guys said nobody in the country was involved with that. And I walked it back with him and said, did you vote at all in a local, state, or federal election? He said, yeah, I voted. I said, did you consider the positions of those for whom you voted and where they stood? He said, well, they didn't say anything about it. And my response was to say, did you make any attempt to ask? I said, are you aware that in a Republican form of government that they would be responsible for voting their mind in the electoral process? And are you aware that at the pinnacle of this election cycle, a president would be elected with the power to appoint the people who made those decisions? Did you take the time to consider? I said, we're all guilty. And God judges nations. He gives warnings and he cries like Jeremiah, the weeping prophet. And he does what he can. He uses a carrot and a stick he does it over and over again. When we supported Israel fully, we were blessed. When we began to turn our back on Israel, we began to experience a curse on our gods, just like, just like the Egyptians did. Our money has been attacked in our economic system. We have had deadly disease that's sexually transmitted. A medical system that was once a absolute best and second to none has begun to crumble. Most young people come out of college with a debt that they can never repay. And that coupled with rising rent costs, now we're at a in a position where it costs more than 70% of what they can bring in the door just to keep a roof over their head and to keep from having their wages attached for student loans. The prosperity is bleeding out of the country. Terrorists, as they attacked Israel, have attacked us, 9-11. Seven years later, our economy had its worst drop in the stock market on record. And the, the value of our homes 
the number one store of value for most American families dropped through the floor. And people, for the first time, who had paid their mortgages faithfully, faithfully and had everything they own invested in their homes were now behind the power curve, upside down, owing more than their home was worth. The end of the next seven year cycle, Israel got nailed once, and then seven years later they were warned and got nailed twice. And on the third cycle, they were taken captives and became a people of the Northern Kingdom, no more. We've had 9-11, seven years later, we've had a drop in the stock market. The next seven year cycle, if you follow such things, the date on the Jewish calendar is Elul 29, it's called the Shmitza. September 13th, 2015. And the nation turns and shakes its fist in the face of God, telling him he's wrong. No repentance. No turning to God. No bending of the knee. Now, do I know what may or may not happen? I got a guess, but that's all it is. You got one man's opinion. I don't know. I know God is merciful. Wouldn't surprise me at all if he didn't choose to just add a little mercy to the pot. I don't know. But I know this. If the pattern continues the way it has, there's times of trouble ahead. Say, okay, what's it have to do with this? When I explained all that to my friend, he was truly shocked. I could tell it in his voice. He said, if all this is the way it is, I'm already way too far behind to catch up. What do I do for my family? What do I do about all of this? I don't have a stack of money to go out and do all kinds of things. And I took him back to the seventh through the eleventh chapter of Romans. And I said, Jeff, what do you do? You get on your face before God and you begin to ask by faith and see what he delivers to your hand. It all comes the same way. Therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, I'm begging you to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your spiritual worship. Get on your knees before God and say, God, not my will, but yours. These things I can see that I need. Please, Lord, do according to your will and need for these things. Do not be conformed to this age, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind so that you may discern what is good and pleasing and perfect will of God. What do you do when you don't know what to do? When trouble is obvious, when you can see it coming down the track and you know the light at the end of the tunnel has got to be a train. What do you do? Here's the answer. Number one, make a decision that no matter what the light is at the end of the tunnel, if God told you to be in that tunnel, don't run. Stay in the tunnel. Number two, have your mind transformed by the washing of the word in context so that you will recognize when God speaks because you've heard it before. Next, discernment will grow and you will know what is the good and perfect and pleasing will of God 
because his word has transformed our thinking. The world today is in massive deception, calling things that are evil good and calling things that are good evil and believing it because they have no baseline with which to judge what's true. Their mind has not been renewed. The Spirit of God is not active in their soul. There's been no change. And that's why ranks of thousands and thousands and hundreds of thousands will stand and declare victory though they are sealing their fate. And God speaks here and says, friend, be not conformed to what they believe, no matter how hardy they party. For by grace, third verse, given to me, I tell everyone among you not to think of himself more highly than he should think. Remember when we make that statement, don't follow anybody that doesn't walk with a limp. Uh, one of the true indications that God has his hand in a man or a woman's heart, they get humble. They just get humble. They just want to lift up Jesus and they just soon not be seen. For by, gra for by grace given to me, I tell you, I tell everyone among you, not to think of himself more highly than he should think. Instead, think sensibly as God has distributed a measure of faith to each one. What a peculiar word, think sensibly. Do you notice here it didn't say feel charitably. It said think sensibly in other words stand back use your head look at things for what they truly are and when you see what they truly are take that measure of faith that you are guaranteed it's an in, it's an earnest of the inheritance you have coming there is faith in a believer's heart Take what you clearly see coming down the pipe and in faith go to God with that. Believe in that. Know that he means only good towards you and take sensible, responsible action. Now, as we have many parts in one body and all the parts do not have the same function, in the same way we, who are many, are one body, in Christ and individually, members of one another. According to the grace that is given us, we have different gifts. Now, this is not an inclusive list of gifts. These are just a few that Paul decided to mention. Let me set this up very quickly. Nobody in this room or that attends here, even semi-regularly, is here by mistake. And every single believer, every one, has gifts. And the reason you are here is because your gift is needed here. The reality is, we need, we need you. It's not just it's nice for you to be here. If you weren't here, something would be wrong. We'd be hurting. We need you. There is something that everybody is capable of adding to this assemblage of believers. And it's something nobody else can do like you can do. Congratulations. 
You've been assigned here. The king of glory has said, yep, they belong with those crazy people. <laughs> According to the grace given to us, we have different gifts. If prophecy, use it according to the standard of one's faith. Now the question comes, what is he talking about when he's talking about prophecy? Prophets did two things. One is foretelling. That's speaking of events that have not yet happened as if they already had. Telling the future. The other is foretelling. That means taking a portion of scripture that God has spoken and explaining it so that it can be understood. If exhorting in exhortation, this is the one that people generally don't understand well. Some people think exhortation means that you're 007 and when somebody does something wrong, you have a license to kill. It's my job to catch them when they fall and exhort them till they get up. I saw it on a t-shirt one time that was explained a different way and it said the beatings will continue until morale improves. There are a lot of folks that have read that exhortation and think that's what it means. It doesn't. You know what this speaks of? Compassion. This is the person that you want to come visit you when you're in the hospital and you're really sick. This is the one that come, come and tell you that Jesus means nothing but good to you. This is the person who walks in when everybody else walks out and it's their gift. Giving with generosity, leading, with diligence. Now giving with generosity. Some people have a gift of giving. And as a result, God frequently puts things in their hands to be able to give. Many people have the gift <clears throat> of giving that is not necessarily monetary. They're the person that's always there to help. They're the person that's always there to make things go whether anybody else pitches in or not.